I'll record also. All right, I'm starting. Everybody on mute. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another Build Your AutoCAD IQ. Welcome to 2017. This is the first webinar of 2017, as you might have noticed. We took January off as we were developing some new and uh, different flows for the webinar series in 2017. So um, today you'll be joined by me, Ryan Bales, and my colleague, Alex. He's in the Boston office, and I think Naman might show up uh, yeah. to help I'm moderate here. it. Oh, Naman's here. I'm here. I'm sorry. You're good. I, I sent you a message saying that I'm uh, going to be at 158, so... Ah, uh, no worries. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the question and answer. I don't know. I sent it through my phone, so... I think oh, I no, saw didn't. something. I don't see no. that question here. Oh, huh, okay. Hmm. I don't know why, but... Yeah, so Alex and I both work at Autodesk Sample Support, and Iman is an expert elite, and he is at a private company out of, I think that's still updated to Ohio. So before we get started, just some uh, quick information. Most of you know, leave your questions in the question window. Naman and Alex will be monitoring the questions while I present. Today we'll be talking about troubleshooting tips and tricks, just some quick things on how to troubleshoot, and um, kind of what we're going to go through is just General stuff, if any of you attended the webinar that I was part of with Victoria, Alex, and Ashley back in November, I talked a little bit about some of these same topics, but I just want to make sure we go through them today in a little bit at length. We're going to talk about backups, autosaves, and just some things to look out for when you get into AutoCAD and start seeing some problems. So just you know, some reminders, it's being recorded. The links will be available. I think Naman puts those in the chat window. Um, here's the upcoming list of things. Today is uh, the 16th of February already. Troubleshooting tips and tricks. Next month will be viewing basics and navigation. Uh, April will be new features for 2018. Uh, May, geometry and drafting and precision. And June, layer modification properties and modification. So we're doing a little bit of different stuff this year. We're doing one every month live. So that's today. And then every so often, we're going to be dumping screencasts um, to our YouTube channel. And those will be pre-recorded, and they'll have different topics from uh, all, most all of our different software, from AutoCAD Plant 3D all the way through mechanical, architectural, et cetera. And so we're going to be posting those. So stay tuned for some updates on that, because that will be changing as we kind of roll through 2017. Um, just some quick links, AutoCAD LT and AutoCAD uh, full, just the, the Getting Started Learn Explore pages, um, just in case you've forgotten where those are or lost your bookmarks or um, were curious where to go get downloads. Um, and then one other thing we wanted to mention, answer date will be next month, um, I believe March 8th, uh, and you can see what we're going to be having. We're going to be BIM, Civil, InfraWorks, Revit, AutoCAD, Civil 3D, and Revit. We're going to be doing most of the AEC products there. So stay tuned for that. That will be pretty neat. Uh, like I said, today we're going to be talking about cleaning AutoCAD drawings, restoring AutoCAD files, autosaves and recover. And then just if I have time, we'll do some identifying different problems with blocks, layers, plot styles, setups, that kind of stuff. That'll be kind of a, a little bit more on the Q&A side too. So I'm going to jump over to AutoCAD and we'll kind of get going here. Um, and so just so you guys can see, I have my default uh, user interface. This is the same drawing we used a couple months ago. Um, I think it's a site layout for it looks like a school. So the big things that we're going to go through today are kind of what I talked about last time, which is purge, uh, purging reg apps, overkill, audits, and then we're going to do some res restoration stuff. So most of you know where purge is at. Um, but a lot of people don't really use it as often as they could. Purge is pretty handy for cleaning up drawings um, when they have a lot of null data or if you want to get rid of something that you can't get rid of normally. So generally with Purge, we just go ahead and type it. It's uh, P use the command. You could type Purge all the way out if you really want. And it will pop up this dialog box. 
So as you can see, this drawing is actually pretty clean. So we're not going to purge anything out yet. We're going to actually add a couple things. So I can just show you guys what it looks like to purge a lot of stuff out. So generally... Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify the email uh, did say Mac, but uh, that is was last month. Mm -hmm. uh, so apologize for the confusion here, and also uh, the fact that uh, you know um, the email was a little bit off <laughs> in a sense. Yeah. Uh, but the links and everything will be corrected uh, mm -hmm. after the fact. Uh, just wanted to kind of clarify that. Uh, yeah, I think the email got carried that. over and. And that was a little bit yeah. from the from the restart on 2017 and the change in the webinar series. So we'll catch it next time. Thanks, Juan. So uh, again, purge. We're going to go ahead and just add some layers in here. So if you go ahead and just start adding layers, and um, we'll just kind of hit new layer a whole bunch of times. Um, I've personally seen this. It's pretty easy to do if you're not really paying attention to it. Uh, we'll just go ahead and add those and just leave them all on there. We'll leave, put nothing on them. And then I think we'll go ahead and just add line types because those are pretty easy, easy to load. So I'm just going to grab everything in the acatalin file. We'll just hit OK. We'll, we're going to skip reloading. Um, well, actually, let's just reload them all. Why not? Because all the ones in use will stay. So this has all the line types in the .lin file by default. We'll just hit OK. So now we got a bunch of stuff we're just not using. It's um, and so this is what purge is for: is removing unused items. So if we go ahead and type purge, we'll see that now we have layers. And these are all the layers that I added, you know, one through twenty-two, and then we can see all these line types. So the big thing about purge is that a lot of this information takes up extra space in the file, and so if we don't need those, uh, we can go ahead and purge them. The big things to look out for when you're talking about purge and, and when to purge stuff is mainly materials. Um, and then when you go into visual styles and extra stuff that's just unused uh, or just adds file size to it. So um, you can always purge per item. So if you go in here and you want to just purge layer 10, you can purge that single layer. And then you can see layer 10 is purged out. Um, or if you want to purge them all, just hit purge all and it'll scan through and purge everything. It'll rescan as soon as you purge all and you can see it found another layer that was empty and we'll just purge that one too. So that's the, the purge dialog box. Uh, it's really good for when you start new drawings. If you copied a file and you just deleted everything, all that information, layering and stuff uh, will remain. But if you do copy the drawing and you need that information, be careful when you go to purge because it will delete those layers, blocks, line types, all that stuff that's that's empty in the drawing file. It does not delete stuff that's in use. So if you have blocks that have been inserted into the model or layer schemes that have objects on them, that information will not be removed. You would have to delete those a different way. So purge is good. It's really good for removing DGN line style data, um, empty text objects and stuff now too, especially with 2017, we have these added functions down here, purge zero line type geometry. I think this is introduced in 15, but in 2017, I know it's really handy. Orphan data, if you have DG and line items and zero length geometry for text and lines that actually have no length to them. So those are really handy to keep on. This, These two will keep your drawings pretty clean if you happen to have those or you inherit a drawing that's pretty messy. Uh, the next one we like to talk about is dash purge, which is essentially the same function done through the command bar or command line. Uh, the main one we're going to look at here is actually called regapps. So regapps are registered applications. Those are loaded whenever you load AutoCAD or any other product on that drawing. They're applications that run in the background. Some of them are in use, some of them are not. They rebuild when you open the drawing and they're needed. So what we do for this, um, you can see it says empty name to purge um, down here and in my handy little cursor box there. So we'll just hit enter. I typically say no. I don't need to verify the, the names of the applications. Uh, we'll just go ahead and hit no and you can see it scans through and deletes all the registered applications that were not in use and needed to be gone. So now we're good. There's no more applications in there. Uh, the important part about regapps is that 
you can get a lot of them in there. Um, we tend to see some that have you know thousands and thousands of them. When you get to a certain point, it really starts to slow down AutoCAD. And so some of them can be corrupted or just cause a huge amount of slowdown in drawings and, and file size. And we try to avoid that, and that's one of the things we look for first when a customer sends us a file here at Tech Support. We try to figure out if there's an issue with the drawing itself. Uh, RegApps is a good place to start. So keep that uh, in mind in the future. And then we'll move on to overkill. So this was a little bit more obscure. I don't know that overkill is used quite as commonly as, as it should be. Uh, it's mainly for 2D line work. And so when you're working a drawing that has two, just base two-dimensional line work, uh, lines, arcs, circles, rectangles, etc., overkill is used to actually clean those up. So when we type it, um, it's got a neat little broom symbol, which uh, I think is pretty cool. We just select everything. Uh, typically with overkill, the more you select, the longer it's going to take. That's pretty standard in AutoCAD, but overkill is kind of um, near the top of that list because it's going to scan every single object as it's working through. So we'll select everything. We can see that 35 objects were on a locked layer. This is a good thing to remember when you're doing overkill. If you do want stuff to not be affected by overkill, lock that layer because Overkill will not do anything to it. Um, once inside the dialog box uh, for Overkill, delete duplicate objects is what comes up. You can see that we have a specific tolerance. This is incredibly high. This is basically lines that end in the exact same point or are right on top of each other. And you can see that we can exclude objects by specific properties. So if we didn't want objects that were green uh, in their properties set by green or by layer, line type, etc., we can eliminate those from the, the delete duplicate objects option here by just selecting those. Um, I leave these off unless I have a specific object or type of objects on a layer or color that I do not want to touch. And again, like I was saying, if you want to just go ahead and lock that layer, that's just the same as ignoring it here. Uh, you can see in the options, this is all on by default, optimized line segments with polylines. This will say if you've got lines that are all ending on, if you've basically drawn a rectangle with four separate line segments, this will turn that into a polyline. Uh, if you don't want polylines to be optimized, or line segments to be optimized with polylines, just go ahead and disable that. And then you can ignore widths and do not break polylines. These are off by default. Um, I would say they're a little bit more advanced. You kind of have to know what polylines you have in there. And then these three, I would say, are probably a good idea to keep on. Associative objects like hatches you want to maintain. Collinear objects. So if you have five line segments all end to end, um, making up one long line, this will combine those. If you have those divided for a specific reason, if you want to dimension them easier or whatnot, you want to uncheck that. But overlapped objects are probably a good idea to generally always keep on unless you have specific circumstances in which you don't want them on. Um, this will, anything that's on top of each other will be combined. So I just go ahead and hit OK on the standard one. It's going to scan through all objects. This one went pretty quick, which is nice. So 16 duplicates were deleted, which means objects that were pretty much right on top of each other. And then 301 overlapping objects were deleted. This made single line segments or polylines out of 301 different objects. So it's a little bit hard to see on the big scale. So I'm going to go ahead and just draw a couple objects close in here, and we'll kind of show it on the smaller scale. So if we have a line coming out here, and we just draw another line, but we don't draw it all the way, you can pretty easily see that we have two line segments. So in Overkill, if we do that and we pick these and just go through here and hit OK, you can see that one overlapping object was deleted, and now we have one line segment. So that's, that's the biggest thing is when you have overlapping objects that are removed, which you know can cause printing issues and, and, and um, if you're listing object quantities or anything like that, especially with blocks, if you have duplicate blocks on top of each other. So those are the, the where I would say, are probably the most important aspect of using overkill. And like I was saying, if we use it on a manually drawn rectangle with line segments and just hit OK, um, 
doesn't always do it. I'm just trying to remember why. But um, the, the big one to me is actually these, when these are end to end. This will actually just combine them into one segment. So that's overkill kind of in a quick little shell there. It's pretty useful um, if you have two objects on top of each other and you want to exclude them. And this one you want to have is red. And you do overkill. And you're trying to find objects that are duplicated. And you're pretty sure they're all of one color. Um, you can ignore object property uh, color. So if these two objects do not have the same color, um, they should be removed. It's kind of, I'm trying to remember what that is, but generally I do it by layer, but that's personal. So anyway, that's uh, overkill and a little bit of a nutshell. I'm sure Naman has some questions he can answer about that and how to exclude stuff a little bit better. And if we have time at the end, we'll go back over that. So I think the next one that we want to talk about is audit. Audit's not one that's run very often. Um, at least when we ask people, they don't generally run it. So for me, I try to run audit at least about once a week on a drawing. I come from the Plant 3D world. We have built-in tools for audit, and so it's a, it's generally a daily function. And that'll keep objects in the drawing um, clean and not corrupt, and it'll scan for any errors. So what we want to do is just hit audit, hit yes, and just let it scan. Um, this is a good clean drawing, so we have actually zero objects that were aired. So if you do have errors, and it will find them and erase the objects with errors, um, that's probably the most important part of it, is just trying to remove objects that can cause problems later, crashing or just general performance issues, plotting issues, that sort of thing. So from here, we're going to go to something that I haven't talked about personally in a while but I figured it would be a good idea to talk about in the troubleshooting, and that's actually restoring files. And so when you save a drawing in AutoCAD, it saves it to, to the specific file folder that you're at. So if you can see here, I've got my webinar folder up. I've got this drawing locked, and you can see that it's got two different lock files, uh, a DWL and a DWL2. These are locked files. These are saying that I've got this drawing open. You can also see a .back file. So the interesting about .back files is the date. Um, they're usually a little bit off. And so there's actually a pretty neat web page we have here. I'm just going to jump to it. Um, i trying to remember where I had that. We'll just pull it up on the browser here. It's called Understanding Backups and Autosaves. So if you've not read through this one before, it's pretty important. It'll talk about backups. And I figured we'd just kind of go through it and kind of explain a little bit of stuff, and then we'd kind of show it. Um, backups are created when you manually save a drawing. Um, by default, they'll be saved in the same exact location. You could set that, but I would leave it because you want to know where those are at, and that's the cleanest place. And just don't mess with those unless you absolutely have to. Um, but a backup, this is the most important part, is a backup is essentially a renamed DWG file. And so because of this, we want to go ahead and just show what that looks like. So if we go into this file and we save this, we can go back to our folder and see that both the user interface drawing and .back file, I just saved my user interface, sorry, but my .back file has not changed. And so what happens is, is if a drawing crashes and you lose that drawing, you, you need to be able to pull it back up. But a lot of times they're a little bit back further in date. So if that's where you are and you can handle that, the, generally the best thing to do with the .back file is to actually just rename this to .dwg. It's going to actually prompt me that I have, I'm renaming it, so you know, be careful because the extension may make it unusable. Because of what that article says and what we know, a dot back is just a dot DWG been renamed. We'll hit rename. It's going to say it already exists because we know it right there. We'll hit yes, and it'll add level two. So now I've got both these files. So one of them is a little bit older, and that's because of uh, just how dot backs are created. 
So it's a dot back file is not a hard backup like you would save a drawing and have backup software automatically scan changes for a file and save it to a, a shadow copy or a network drive or, or somewhere where you have backups. And that's an important point too is that we recommend having that because of how autosaves and backups are located and saved. It's, it's very good to have as many options as you can when saving and backing up files, especially when we're talking about, you know, thousands of dollars at stake. So basically this just created a brand new DWG. We can, based on what that doc back file was, this was saved a couple days ago. Um, we can go ahead and we'll just reopen this one and we'll just hit save again. And there should be a new dot back file created as of today. And so that's where we can see that. If you wanted to, um, it's, it's, like I said, it's during manual save, and I think you have to actually go up here and hit save. Um, but now we can see that there's another, another dot dot back file created as soon as I save that drawing. So that's backups. Um, backup files are created only if the system variable I save back is set to one. So keep that in mind too. If you've set that variable to zero, it will not do backs. So I'm not going to go through the express tool there. The next one we're going to talk about is autosaves. So autosaves are, are an interval in, uh, in AutoCAD, and the important part about it is that the are only done if a drawing has been modified after the last save, Q save, save, save as, will delete the current autosave file and halt the automatic save timer until the edit is made to the drawing. A lot of people forget that that's the case, and they just think, well, I opened it and I didn't do anything, and autosave should have worked. But if you didn't actually do anything in the drawing, autosave is not going to work if you just opened it. So we can see the autosave timer a couple different ways. The, my preferred way is just to go through options. And then under the open and save tab, the file safety precautions option, there's automatic save. This is checked, and this timer is set to minutes between saves. You can adjust this down or up to your desire. I generally leave it at 10. Um, and then that'll, that's how you kind of just let it autosave. So if you were to, to set this down to one minute and edit changes, and then every time you stopped doing anything and the drawing sat for one minute after an edit with no save, it would automatically save. And the other thing about autosaves is where they're located, because you can see there is no file with that extension right here. So to find these files, we have to look at their, their basic location. By default, they're in your personal temp directory. Um, cool little neat trick about finding your temp directory is actually just going up here and typing percent temp percent, and it'll just pop open your personal temp directory. Uh, if we sort these by type, we can kind of go through here and see you know, what these are. Um, folders are always going to be listed first, but the big thing to do, what I do if I'm trying to find my autosave, sort by date modified. So we'll see a couple different drawings in here that are based by AutoCAD. An AutoCAD temporary file is basically a cache file that stores all commands in a drawing before last save. Like if you were to undo, um, so you just undo a bunch of commands, that's actually that information stored here in these temporary files. These have auto-generated names, similar to a, an autosave file. So if we go down here a little ways, we can see, you know, I have a, a .back file in here. Um, that's because I opened one of these files. And then if we look, we can find a, um, see if we can't find an autosave. So here's an autosave right here. So this was created a long time ago, but that's because I have saved these drawings recently. So for the, if we actually set the option for this to save one minute and we do a bunch of stuff and just let it sit, we can actually watch it autosave. So if we do that, we just open up our option. We just let it sit for a minute. It should autosave here in a little bit because I haven't saved it. And this is the important thing about knowing and understanding when a drawing is actually saved is if you look up here, you can see an asterisk next to the file name. There's not one here, but there is one on the tab. So this right here 
is telling us that the drawing is actually not saved is what that means. If you were to go ahead and save the drawing manually, that would go away. I'll show you that here in a second. I want to see if this will actually auto save on us. I think I can actually be moving around too. This is the longest minute of your life. You know, when you're presenting a webinar about auto saving. My AutoCAD. So while that's going through there, and we'll just kind of leave it in the background, let it do its thing. I'm going to go ahead and kind of explain how to restore automatic save files, and then we'll go check our auto save directory and see if we got one. So we can go ahead and do very similar to renaming them, but generally a good thing to do is actually copy them out of the temp directory, then rename them. It's very similar to, auto, to dot backs in that renaming the SV dollar sign extension to dot DWG will cause that file to now become a drawing again. So we can go in here and see, did we get a, did we get one? There we go. Woohoo! So I was proved right. That's always exciting. So we can see here, autosave set to one, let it sit, but did something else. We can see that it saved an automatic save file to this location, which is my temp directory. And we can see where AutoCAD's doing that. If we go through here, I think that's, uh, what was that at? Automatic save file location. There we go. If you look here, we can see it's in my personal app data local temp. Like I said, if you go into here and just type percent temp percent, it'll pop open, and we can see this file. So if we copy this file, which is um, basically a time-stamped file, we can just go ahead and copy it, and we'll just put it in our little handy webinar folder here. So this file is not really usable quite yet, because we actually need to rename it. So we'll just go down here, and we'll just type DWG. And as you can see, this file is also now a DWG, and it's going to look identical to how we had this right here. And that's why it's important to remember autosaves are really nice because it gives you the closest to where you were versus the dot back, which is changed when you save it. And I, I find dot backs to be a little less reliable in that sense. The most reliable is obviously going to be a server uh, or, or program that scans your computer for file changes or a network for file changes and copies every time this is changed. I say autosaves are probably next because they're usually really close. If you've worked on something and it it's you know you've gone through the timer, which I set it to one, so it autosaved at that point. Um, anytime I were to change this file again, if I copied anything or moved anything or undid my last copy, let it sit for another minute, even if I'm moving around, it's going to autosave. So that's the important part about autosaves is they are very quick and they're pretty consistent. As soon as you save this file, and we'll save it, and you can notice that my little asterisk went away there. Let me go back to our temp directory. You can see that the file that I had copied is actually now gone. And that's because every time you manually save, that autosave file is then gone. And so it's, for autosaves, while they're really reliable as far as right in the moment, as soon as that file is saved, it's gone, which is good because as soon as you save it, you really need a, a random timestamp backup. So we can see that we had that file, we used it, that's fine. So a lot of you may know too how to access these files a different way, and that's generally through recover. And so when you go to recover a file, if we recover our, our little uh, user interface drawing, we can go ahead and open this. Um, well, let's close it first, why not? So when I recover, I typically just open a brand new drawing, um, just default template type recover. It does pop open automatically when a drawing crashes. We'll go ahead and hit recover. Um, it's going to go through the recovery process. There, it's going to auto the drawing and look for it. So the important thing, too, is it's going to open that drawing right away. But what you normally see when AutoCAD crashes is the recover manager. 
um, I think is what it's called. Drawing, there, drawing recovery. I was called the recovery manager, probably because it says it right there. So if we go ahead, I think you have to, let's go ahead and open that guy and see. Now you're going to see that when it's crashed. So see there I was, I got proved right on an auto save and then recovery manager got me. So when you do have a crashed file and you reload AutoCAD and you open this up, it's going to have this, it's going to say the file name. So in some cases it'll say user interface for this case and then it would say user, user interface dot back. Um, I might be able to get it to crash, but I don't want to try to do that. And then it'll have the, uh, the autosave name too, where the autosave file is located. And when you go ahead and lo load that drawing, you can recover it through the back file or this, the autosave or just try to recover the main drawing if it's been saved pretty recently. So this is only open when a drawing crashes. It initiates the recovery manager command next time you launch AutoCAD. Um, and there is no backup information, that's fine because our drawing's totally good. So that is restore and recover dot back autosave. Um, the important part to remember is where those are at. Autosaves are in your temp file. Dot back files are with the drawing. So we do have a little bit of time, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of go through the, the last little bit um, before all this kind of happens, where to look for problems. And so problems are, are kind of an ambiguous word in AutoCAD. I think we, we try to you know, limit what that means. I generally just say anything that's going to cause an issue later. Um, some of the biggest ones that I know of are like units or colors or uh, layers, blocks, and page setups are generally the five that I kind of think about and look for. Um, units, you know, a drawing has specific units. Um, generally, if a unit is set to architectural, it's really just displayed through the architectural style. It doesn't mean that it's different units than decimal. It just means that the unit looks differently. So it's still, if I were to set this to decimal and type 12, that's still technically 12 inches or one foot. But in architectural, that scheme is different in which where I type 12, it's still going to be inches. It's just going to display as one foot dash zero inches. So this does not mean that the drawing itself is scaled to be in millimeters or inches. That's a whole different process. And so what we want to do is make sure that we, we understand that it's by default in imperial inches unless you select a template or change the units of a drawing to be metric. Um, the insertion scale, however, can be set to millimeters. So if you were to insert an object and you had the insertion scale not set to the matching units of your drawing, you were inserting millimeter blocks, it's going to insert that scale a little bit wonky. Um, I don't change the lighting or angle precision. Uh, very often, but these two are the most important to remember. If you're having trouble drawing, you say, you know, 12 inches when it's set to decimal, and you want to draw a 12-inch line, and you type 12 inches and hit enter, it's going to actually not let you do it, and that's because the units are different. Like I said, it's not units in that it's imperial metric, it's units in how it's displayed and how it's interpreted. So if we reset that back to architectural, we can type, you know, 12, and it's going to do it as well. But if we type 12 inches, it's going to be, it's going to understand what we're saying. So units are good because if you have different drawings that are in different units, and you're having trouble drawing, AutoCAD's going to. I would, I would usually look there first if you're trying to draw lines or circles, and it's not understanding that you're. <clears throat> excuse me, typing inches or feet, then look at units first. And then insertion scale is really important because it's really easy to get that off. But units is also important to look at when you're drawing generally because you can draw in a drawing not set to metric, which again is a complicated procedure, set in, in decimal. And if you were to draw in metric, it'd be no different because it's just base units. So if I were to draw in to me, what would be a 100 millimeter object, I would just type 100 because this is 100 units in AutoCAD. So that's where units is a little bit wonky is that the actual units command is specifically one fixed length of an object or one fixed length in AutoCAD. So 
that's where you can not set a drawings units to metric or imperial, but still draw an imperial or metric by typing, you know, 1,000. So if this if this drawing was going to be metric, we would say, oh, that's 1,000 thousand millimeters or 1,000 meters or whatever you have it set to. But if we change our units to architectural, you know, this is actually going to be 1,000 feet or 1,000 or inches, sorry, 80, 83 feet, 4 inches, 1,000 inches. So it's um, that's the important part to remember. If you have two different drawings, one scaled differently than the others, and then how to scale those if you get them back. It's really important when you have XREFs because XREFs are going to be, you can draw an XREF and insert it in. <clears throat> when you insert it in, if somebody's drawn it in imperial or metric, you'll bring it in and it'll be huge scale. So one of the big things that we I like to do when I, I check that is um, just go ahead and insert one and we'll just insert that auto saved that we had. Um, because it'll be cool to have the same drawing on top of each other. So we'll go ahead and insert our autosave. Um, we're just going to leave the block unit set to inches. So it's going to actually look really identical. We're not going to notice it's there. We insert it at 0, 0, 0. So we now have an XREF on top of our other object. So if we were to have this drawing, our autosave drawing that was yeah, you know, set to Imperial, and we'll go ahead and we'll just go in this drawing. We're actually just going to scale it up um, to be metric. And I, the way I do that is just scale it by 25.4, which is, you know, millimeters to inch. So if we scale this by 000, zero, zero whoops, we'll just do 25.4. Oop, that's huge. That was 254. That's definitely not metric. It's a lot of objects to scale, but hey, why not? So we'll scale that and we're just going to go ahead and, and save and we'll jump back into our main drawing here. And we load this extra again. We can see that it, uh, when we zoom out, we can't even see it because we scaled it up so high. So what we normally do, what I do is go ahead and select the XREF, go into Properties, and if this is the case, it's going to be set to 1. Um, but if you do it to um, the right, which would be you know 1 divided by 25.4 to get it back, so which I think is uh, 0.039. 3.8 or something like that. So now we can go back. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Good to go. So we can see it's a little bit off, and that's just because the scale is slightly off. So if you wanted to, you could go ahead and scale it by object. Generally, the easiest way to do it is actually just to, to do it as an equation. Uh, I think it's 1 over 25.4. And then um, I think we can, and this is usually because of round off. So if you were to change the precision way out, we could see in our XREF that we're a little bit off. So see how that one's there. There we go. So that's the important part of remember about units too is if you don't have your precision set very high and you go to scale something down and you, you think you're doing it, you know, one divided by 25.4 like we did through the calculator and you don't have that precision set, these last digits are not actually going to show up. So if we go ahead and, and set that and we can cut it out. So now we can see that we have our our metric <clears throat> plan extract on top of our inch plan, we've just scaled it down by 25.4 to make it match. So that's a, just the quickest tip about inserting XREFs and in scale. So we're just going to go ahead and detach that. So the big thing too from here is, like I said, colors, layers. I think that's about all we're going to have time for, and then we'll do some Q&A if, if there is any. So colors. You can set, most all of you know, you can set objects color here. 
and by layer and just exist in every, everywhere you can imagine. So we can go ahead and, and set it to blue or, or whatever. And this overrides the layer color, as we can see, which was cyan. So the biggest issue I see with this is if you're trying to quick select or you're trying to do any overkill or trying to print and an object isn't printing correctly because you have your CTB set and all your objects are by layer. But if you have objects that aren't by layer because you've set them to a specific color, those objects will then print associated to that color in the plot style. So if you go into plot style, and I've talked about this in, in a previous webinar about plot styles, sorry, uh, about plot styles, when you go in here and look at these, it's not by layer, it's by color. So if you change an object's color from teal or cyan or, or color four to color five, it's going to print based on this color, not what the layer color is set to there. So th when you talk about color and you want to set colors, just remember that any object not set to by layer will print according to that color if you're using um, color dependent plot styles, not name dependent plot styles. And we went through that in that webinar too. So if you want to look back at that one, that'd be a good one as well. Um, the biggest thing I like to check and do when I'm talking about colors and I want to change them all is uh, you can actually do it here. And so we can go ahead and just change everything to magenta and we'll except for lock layers. So when we go ahead and click off, Everything is now magenta, which seems pretty radical and extreme at first until we remember that because by layer or by block is an option, we can always just go ahead and back and reset it here. Um, and that'll reset everything back to its normal by layer color. So it's also cool to do that um, with XREFs because XREF colors are kind of weird. So colors, that's where I would look first. When you when you have XREFs in your drawing like our user interface drawing. Um, and remember, we have that scale that we can put in. So if we actually start our little calculator here, um, we can do this right up front. And I can show you how to do that too. I'll do one divided by 25.4. We'll copy this. Oop, that's not what I wanted. There we go. And we'll just put it there. So if we go to our, our layer manager, we can see XREF colors are separated. So all colors will be down here. And if we go to XREF, the same colors are going to be there. So you can change and override layer colors here. It's a little bit trickier to get them back. Um, there's a couple, I know it, all companies do that a little bit different. You can have layer colors persist, or every time you insert or update an XREF, it uses only the, the colors located in the XREF. Um, Naman, do you remember what that command is? Yeah, it's called XREF Override. It's on 2017, yeah. uh, 2016 and 17. Yeah. Um, it's an awesome command that I just found out. I mean, yeah. it will override all the by uh, layer overrides and object level overrides and everything. So. Yeah. So keep that in mind. That's super handy to do. And I think if we in in those future webinars that are going to be talking about layering that's going to come up. So keep in mind that I'm not going to go into the length about it now, but they will talk about it. All I want to do is talk about what to look for when you have issues with, with XREFs. And so if we come into our XREF here, um, if all of these XREFs are changed, the, there is a couple different ways to get them back. You can always detach, reattach. Um, there's no easy way to just reset, but that's where that command um, Naman is talking about it was introduced recently so that's a cool little one to do you can restore layer states save layer states but layers and, and XREFs are really important especially with colors because you're dealing with a lot of different override settings and anytime you make a change here it's only overriding the XREF color in this drawing so if I were to change all of these colors in this XREF um, let's just say to white color 7 we can see that my XREF is going to be a little bit faded out. Even if I save this drawing, we go back to our XREF, these colors don't change in the XREF. Uh, they, they stay um, as is. You can see here, um, even if we save and, and anything, these colors don't change. That's because when you change an XREF color in a drawing, it's only going to stay in that drawing. So that's... Uh, that's the biggest thing too, and then that XREF command Naman is talking about. So 
the last thing about layers that I want to talk about is uh, two separate layers that we have that are in by default in every drawing, and that's actually layer zero and def points. And so def points in layer zero actually have a pretty interesting relationship with blocks and objects. And in almost all circumstances, it's important to keep those layers in a drawing named as they are and untouched. Um, they generally can cause problems, if you, especially def points, if you mess with def points. So if you go ahead and actually delete def points, which you can do if there's nothing on it, and I'll show you that in a, in a new drawing because you can't do it in a drawing with it used objects. So if we go into layer in the new drawing, these are just this is a basic template. It's got all these drawings. We can go ahead, there's nothing on def points. Um, and we'll get this warning, layer zero and def points can't be deleted. That's because they have that special relationship. But you actually can force it to be deleted um, a different way. And so this is one of those things that I've seen this is incredibly powerful and dangerous. So if def points is gone like that, this will cause problems and you go to print and put objects on there and you'll see a bunch of weird stuff. Cool thing about AutoCAD, if you don't see a def points layer and you create a new layer named def points, um, well, it used to do it anyway, it used to reset. Man, it's twice today I've been proven wrong by AutoCAD. Oh no, it did. So if you create a drawing called def points, it'll automatically be placed on a no plot layer it will, however, keep the same color, so just reset the color. Um, so that's important to remember. If you do need to add def points back, it'll re-add back. You just have to change the color because you base it on that color. So uh, layer zero is the same way. Don't just best practice is don't touch layer zero or def points. Leave them off, and you can see even if you look at the icon on the layer here for the state, the zero and def points have their own little um, blue trapezoid, I guess versus the other ones. So layer zero and depth points, keep them. So the other big thing with, uh, with layers that's pretty cool is uh, you get a whole ton of different ways to freeze and thaw stuff. So if we go into our um, main drawing here, you can see we have different options for freeze and thaw. Uh, you have um, on and off, which is just just the layer on and off, freeze and thaw. They have different relationships in AutoCAD. So if you're having issues with drawings that are you know, objects that are persisting, objects that are frozen, objects that aren't selectable. The objects can actually be both on or off and frozen or thawed. So these are separate. Um, if you create a new layer and have it on new VP freeze, when you create a new viewport, that layer will be frozen in that viewport, which brings up viewport freezing. So if you go into a viewport and we go in here, our layer option will now actually have a separate set of freezing for viewport frozen. And so objects can actually be frozen through a viewport and not in model space. So if we went ahead and just selected all this stuff and froze it in the viewport, our viewport would be blank. But if we go back into model space, nothing's frozen. And it's actually it works both ways. So that's another additional level of of isolation you can have when creating drawings. It also causes that weird little hiccup if you're not in the viewport. So if we go into into Brig or AutoCAD and we see all oh, the layers are not frozen in new viewports or the current viewport, we actually have to go into that viewport. And I easiest way to do that is just double click in the viewport. You can see that the viewport was selected. Our view is selected. This is really helpful to have viewports locked if you're doing this so you don't change the scale, zoom in and out, pan, etc. Then you just come back in here and turn the viewport, the layers that are frozen in the viewport back on. So I've seen that quite a few times. Um, that happens if new viewports are frozen or you inherit a drawing that's just like that or create a new viewport, stuff's not there. Go into layer and just scroll over and check VP freeze. Um, you can do a lot with viewports too. You can have different line types for different layers. These overwrite only in the viewports. So it is cool. You can you can kind of add that extra level uh, of of control when you go to plot and print. But as I mentioned, we're trying to make sure that this is how we eliminate problems. So go ahead and look here. Um, if things don't match up, this is a good it's a good bet that this is where they don't match up. So we'll go ahead and close layer, and I think that's about it. Do we have any questions, Damon?
Um, I don't. Um, oh well, there were some uh, questions about, uh, in general, idea about how to remove Excel data links. I answered that. Uh, you have to type in the data link command if you have mm -hmm. unreferenced uh, in the XREF dialog box to clean those up. Um, and I posted a screencast as well, so people can refer to that. Nice. Uh, uh, quick process of doing it. Um, and uh, it says, are there any tutorials regarding sheet sets and creating data fields? Well, uh, we have a lot of webinars that we did in the past. So mm -hmm. I, I can, uh, uh, if you click on that YouTube link, uh, you should be able to see our playlist. And there have been a lot of uh, items that we did on in terms of attributes extraction and um, yeah. in terms of sheet sets and how to use fields in the project and whatnot. So it's, a, it's you know, if you, you may want to just check out that. Um, yeah. And uh, that would be my recommendation at first, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I think that about, um, uh, I think that's about it. Um, I think there were, somebody was asking about um, how to create a new layer to appear only in a viewport. I don't think so we can do that unless you use layer filters or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you could essentially freeze it or turn it off in model space and only activate it in the viewport, but all layers are going to exist in both spaces. They just have different control levels in one space versus another. Um, so well, there is a, you know, isn't there a VP freeze new command or uh, the in the layer dialog box? Uh, I don't know if they are referring yeah, to that you, option. So if you can pull in, up your Yeah, when we go in here and we create a new layer, um, we can set this to be um, VP frozen so that when we go into a viewport, And we go into here and we find layer one uh, and we go over to the viewport freeze section. You can see right there it's off by default. Uh, or new viewport freeze. And there's actually no objects on it and there's no new viewports. So the trouble is when you create that layer, it's referencing brand new viewports. So if we do the viewport and we create a new one, in this viewport layer one, should actually be frozen and you can see it, it is. So it only references new viewports. Um, you would still have to come in here and freeze it manually if you wanted to do that manually. So Yeah, I think he may have been asking about the opposite of that. Yeah, and I don't think that that's possible. I think um, you, there, the only way that I would think of doing it would be have it frozen or off in model space and then not in in, in layout space or in the viewport but there's no way to have only layout space or viewport layers. Um, there's viewport overrides, but there's no viewport onlys. I think that's all about, as I said, hold on, if a layer zero is frozen, maybe off to, there may be other complications with def points and layout tabs. And so he's uh, saying he now knows why. <laughs> yeah, so that's it's true. And it, it's one of those things that's not really like, uh, hey, you know, don't shut those off. Like I said, if you go into layer and try to delete those just through the layer function, you do get that warning. Um, but you can, but, you know, because you get this, you know, can't delete them. But that doesn't mean you can't have them frozen or off, um, which is a... Um, is one of those things that nobody really talks to you about. Def points is okay to have frozen or off, especially in layouts. If you put your viewports on def points, they don't print. Uh, a lot of people just go ahead and create a brand new no plot layer. I think this one paper might actually be a no plot layer. I didn't. Where was that at? Let's see. And it, yeah, I'd like that better, uh, you know, because uh, I typically do not want to freeze def point. It does have some issues. I know that, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I agree. What. And so you can see, like, this layer right here is set to no plot. The important part about it versus def points is the way that that symbol looks. Def points is, is automatically no plot ever. And, uh, and any layer can be set to no plot. Uh, but def points cannot. You can click this all you want. Nothing changes. So um, I agree with you, Naman. I typically always create a no plot layer, even though it looks redundant and can be, just because you leave def points alone.
Well, I think that's about it then. I think we'll just go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And like I mentioned, we're going to be having um, – we'll just go through here all the way to the end. More webinars are coming up. Like I said, the schedule for these is going to be as follows here. We're going to march. Um, I think Victoria is going to be doing that one. Volker, I know, will be back in April to talk about new features. So everybody who missed Volker, he will be back. And then uh, once a month, just keep looking out. It's about the second week or so of every month. And then just look for new screencast stuff on the on the YouTube page. And um, it'll be in the emails and, and stuff as well. So we'll be putting that. And if you have any questions about content, just use the email alias about it that we have for the uh, the webinars. I think that is back here a little ways. So the autodesk.help.webinars. If you're curious about when content will be released or what content is coming up, um, and that will be there. So, again, thanks, everybody, for joining us, and have a good rest of your week and month, and we'll see you next time. Was hey, Ryan, can I just quickly add uh, something uh, about that? Uh, so I apologize uh, to kind of cut in. You're perfect. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, somebody was asking about AutoCAD 2018, new drawing format or something like that, and I would recommend that you can join the customer council. Yeah. Uh, then I posted the links on the and the PowerPoint has it, and that mm -hmm. gives you a lot, uh, much head access to it, and then you can influence a lot of stuff. And they usually do like bug yeah. hunts and things like that, mm -hmm. and award prizes as well. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, the other thing I wanted to remind you: were there any polls that you wanted to run, or are we away getting away? Shoot, from polls? I forgot polls. You guys want to run okay. a poll? What do you want to run? Let's see. Yeah, I let you do it, man. I'm uh, I off. forgot. I just totally. I was wondering what I missed. See, that's what happens when you take a month and a half off. Let's do answer day because answer day is coming up next month. Is anybody going to be on answer day? Nobody's on answer day. Only four percent have voted. So you guys know answer day is is the time which you go just go post on the forums, and uh, we have extra Autodesk staff, and I think expert elites too that are all taking part in answering questions. So it's a good idea if you have general questions, customizations, you know, if you have a persistent problem that's maybe not tech support uh, level, but you just want to know if it can be fixed or changed or if there's a different way to do it. Answer day is that that time to do that. So it looks like. Most of you have not joined Answer Day, so I would say if you want to come out on on the eighth and just check out the forums, you'll see a lot of people. There's a there's usually people all across the globe doing it. So, and again, yeah, Ryan, I, AC. Oh, Ryan, I just want to step in. Um, it seems that uh, some folks are a little confused about the date on the screen of your poll. Um, the eighth of March is the next Answer Day. It is not October twenty seventh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, you can ask questions on October 27th, but uh, you won't get any answers. That's a while. But yeah, you March can 8th. ask those, yes, but uh, you can post on the forums anytime, and the expert elites oh, yeah. are always there, and there are other people yeah. there that can answer. Yeah, and we do have dedicated people on the forums, uh, AutoCAD and, and some of the other forums that work you know, constantly to, to answer and help with questions. So let's Can see. I give a shout out to John Welk on AutoCAD forums? Yes, He's John Velick. Yeah. Well, yeah, John's on the AutoCAD forums, and he is a forum monster. So you'll see his name a lot. So let's go ahead and launch the, is this your first webinar? <laughs> oh, man. So most of you have sat through Volker and I's awkward presentations before. <laughs> That's good. See, the important part about this this one, Naman, is that I don't embarrass myself too much because I know most people have heard me before. Or was this your first webinar should be the question now. <laughs> it really should be, is this going to be your last webinar? All right. Sure. It looks like most of you have been here before, so <clears throat> remember to tell others about it. And if you, uh, if you have any ideas for topics, send it to the alias, um, and we'll be – especially for content, if you want to see some expanded content for the webinar series and screencasts, send that to the autodesk.help. And if it's something that we feel is pretty common and we have time to do it, we'll jump on it and create a screencast on how to do something. So 
the benefits of the way we're going to be doing it this year is we have that freedom with the, the screencast content because all of us are going to be throwing out content. So if you have those ideas, send those ideas and requests to the webinar and we'll try to get those implemented in screencasts. So again, thanks for joining everybody. I'm going to jump off here now. It's, it's been an hour and have a good one.